Today on Renewing Your Mind, Dr. R.C. Sproul gives us something to consider. If the Lord Jesus came in the church today and said, can I have a word with you? I'd like you to go to Iraq. How soon would you pack? Not crying and moaning and groaning, but filled with joy in your soul that He stopped by you and said, go for me. Throughout history, men have been faithful to God's call to go and make disciples. Today on Renewing Your Mind, the Apostle Paul is our example. He was a man who faced hardship, persecution, even the threat of death, but he never gave up or looked back. On this Lord's Day, we continue Dr. R.C. Sproul's verse-by-verse sermon series through the book of Acts. We've been following Paul's missionary journeys the past few weeks, and we've been encouraged and amazed at his perseverance through trials. As we get started today, we'll be in chapter 21 of Acts. Here's Dr. Sproul. As we've seen on numerous occasions as we've been looking through the book of Acts, that when Luke tells of points of transition from one city to another during the apostolic missionary journeys, he will give us a brief little travelogue citing the places that are visited or passed by during this trip. And chapter 21 is no different as he tells us how the apostolic entourage makes their way from Miletus down to Caesarea. And they begin their journey on a small ship, which were called coasting ships in the ancient world because they were not large enough or strong enough to be sailed in the open seas. So these coasting ships would, as the word suggests, hug the coast and stay very close to the shore as they made their way along. And while they were on such a vessel, they stopped at coast that was known in the ancient world for this reason. There, one of the most prestigious medical schools in the whole world was located. It was the school founded by Hippocrates from whom we get the name of the Hippocratic Oath. And then from coast they went on then to Rhodes, and you've all heard of Rhodes because in the ancient world one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was this gigantic, huge statue whose legs straddled the entrance to the harbor of Rhodes and was known as the Colossus of Rhodes. But by the time Paul makes his way to Rhodes, the Colossus is not so colossal anymore because an earthquake had happened that brought it down, crashing down and broken into many pieces. From there, they traveled on to Patara, and its claim to fame was a local oracle who had some degree of rivalry with the famous Oracle of Delphi. And then they finally left that ship and went to a seagoing vessel that was loaded with cargo and sailed down to Phoenicia, in which they sighted Cyprus on the way, sailing to Syria and landing at Tyre. We were told there the ship would unload her cargo. And Luke says, in finding disciples there, we stayed seven days. And these disciples told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And Luke makes that notation there. He said, then when we finished those days, we went again on our way, and they all came to us to the seaside, to the shore, just like the elders had done in Ephesus, praying with them before they boarded the ship to continue their journey. He said, when we finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemaeus. We greeted the brethren, stayed there one day, and now it's the next day that demands our attention in the text. For on the next day, Luke writes, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. This is remarkable. We've met Philip already back in chapter 8. He was one of those set apart and was used of God for outreach and missions, and he had traveled in his journeys to Caesarea, and there 
he settled, and now it's 20 years later from the time of his consecration. He's still there in Caesarea, and Paul and Luke and their party come in and meet up with Philip and have a wonderful time, obviously, hearing all that had transpired among the Christians there in Caesarea. Now, Luke also gives us the little notation that in the interim, Philip and his wife had had four daughters who had grown up and remained unmarried, and they all had the gift of prophecy. But then what happens, we are told, is that after many days, a certain prophet named Agabus, we met him earlier in the book of Acts as well, he came down from Judea. And Luke writes, when he'd come to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own hands and feet. And this is kind of weird. It's kind of strange. Here comes Agabus, comes into the house where Paul is, and he says to the apostle, Paul, would you please take off your belt? Let me have it for a minute. Paul says, sure. He takes off his belt. He gives it to Agabus. Agabus takes the belt of the apostle and goes over and sits down, leans over, and ties the belt around his own wrists and around his feet, joining his hands to his feet in this binding by the belt of Paul. Now, what's going on here? Agabus at this moment is following a tradition that was rich in Old Testament history and even earlier in the New Testament, where the prophets of old would not only deliver the oracles of God with their lips, with their mouths, with basic speech, but they would also give object lessons, dramatizing the word that God had given to them. Ahijah, in the early days, tore his garment, symbolizing that the united kingdom of Israel would be torn asunder with the death of Solomon. You remember Isaiah shocked everybody when he became the first recorded streaker in biblical history. He took all of his clothes off including his sandals, and walked down the street barefoot, giving the message that all could see that this is how God was going to deal with the Egyptians. He would strip them naked, and He would humiliate them and drive them away. And then we think of Ezekiel who built a replica of Jerusalem and used it to show the people in their eyes visibly what God was going to do when He visited His wrath upon the city. You know, in the revolution of worship that we've seen in the 20th and 21st century, church services around the country are given now to having skits on Sunday morning. And the skits become the focal point of the drama. One of those speakers at our conference this weekend pointed out that if you want visible drama, in church on Sunday morning, why don't we use the drama that our Lord Himself gave in the institution of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper? You see, in these sacraments, we not only hear the Word of God, we see it. It's made visible to us. We can see that table we see the cup. We see the bread. We see the water of baptism. And we act out the drama that was won for us in Christ, in which Jesus said, you show forth my death until I come. And so this tradition is used again by Agabus to show as well as to speak the divine Word. But in this case, the Word is ominous. The Word is foreboding. It's not an oracle of weal. It's an oracle of woe. As He then speaks, and He said, the one whose belt I have used to bind my feet and to bind my hands will be bound over 
in Jerusalem and be given over to the Gentiles. Now, when Luke heard this, he tells what he and his companions did in response. And to his credit, or to the supervision of the Holy Ghost, Luke was moved and inspired to include a record of his own shame in his record of the Acts of the Apostle, because he confesses that when Agabus gave this prophecy, he said, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with Him not to go up to Jerusalem. They watched the demonstration. They watched the belt. They watched Agabus hand it back to Paul, and they started crying, pleading, Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. We need you. We've already lost our Lord who left us, departed this world, and ascended into heaven, but He anointed you to be the apostle to the Gentiles. You can't leave us. Don't go to Jerusalem. On December 7th, 1941, the United States of America was attacked in an act of war which war was declared the following day by the President of the United States who said that that date would live forever as a day of infamy. On December the 8th, Monday, 1941, the recruiting office of the United States military had the highest number of volunteers come that they ever had in American history. At that time, my father was too old to be drafted. He was safe from the draft. And in our community, they asked him to be the chairman of the local draft board, which job he accepted. And after a few months of this where they would make decisions as what men would go to war, what men would be deferred and stay home, and so on, one night he shocked everybody in our house when he after one of these meetings, he appeared at the back door of the kitchen, came in the kitchen completely dressed in an army uniform. And my mother dropped whatever she had in her hand. She looked at him. And she said, what have you done? And he said, honey, there's no way in the world I could keep sending those kids to war and not go myself. I have to go. I'm constrained to go. My mother told me about this. She cried. She pled. Oh, honey, that's nice, but take that uniform back. They'll, they'll take it back. They'll understand. And isn't it interesting that when people are called to do their duty and when that duty involves danger and peril and risk, it is the person's closest friends and family that inevitably try to talk them out of it. People who should be supporting those who are seeking to do their duty become impediments to it. Think of Jesus after the Mount of Transfiguration, and the disciples' eyes were filled with that glory still. They wanted to stay there forever, and Jesus said, well, fellas, it's time to leave. Where are we going? Well, I'm going to Jerusalem, where I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die. And in the first papal encyclical by Simon Peter, he said, may it never be. Oh, no, you don't. This Jesus who had just given him the name Petros, Peter, now gave him another name. He said, get behind me, Satan. And he set his face as a flint to Jerusalem. Family, friends, trying to dissuade him. When I was in college, 
I became a Christian my freshman year. I was so filled with zeal, so excited. Used to meet with a bunch of Christians in our college class in a room in one of the local churches, and we'd meet every Wednesday night for prayer, for Bible study, and one of the things that we liked to do would be we'd gather around the piano, and one of the fellows would play the piano, and we would sing these old gospel hymns. I'd been raised in a very formal Presbyterian church and remained in unbelief through that experience. And I'd never heard any of these hymns before in my whole life. Hymns like, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way. Hmm? Standing on the Promises. How many of you have ever heard that? Standing on the Promises. Yeah, see. He lives. Remember that one? I serve a risen master. He lives. The... Terrible theology. <laughs> you know the refrain in that? You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That's the only place Christ lives is in your heart. We're in deep trouble. <laughs> and if the only reason you have for your apologetic is the feeling in your heart, you're in trouble. But the one I loved the most was where he leads me. I will follow. Sang that song every Wednesday night. And when we would sing it, my soul would just be flooded with joy. And my eyes would mist over and fill up with tears. And, and I would sing, you know, where he leads me, I will follow. I can hear my Savior calling. Remember that? And I want to tell you something. When I sang that, I meant it. If the Lord would have come in that room and said, Pakistan, Iraq, Korea, Bulgaria, anywhere, I said, I'm going. Wherever you lead me, that's where I want to go. Of course, then I matured in the Christian faith. Found out that some places are far less desirable than others, and there are many times in my life I'd say, most of the places that you'll lead me, Lord, I'll follow, but please don't lead me over there. <laughs> Yet we have to grant, don't we, that you all would admit that if the Lord Jesus came in the church today, walked down the aisle, stopped by you, Rick, you, boss, and said, can I have a word with you? There's something I need you to do for me. I'd, I'd like you to go to Iraq tomorrow. How soon would you pack? Would you not leave in haste? Pack your bags, not crying and moaning and groaning, but filled with joy in your soul that He stopped by you and said, go for me. Huh? What Christian wouldn't want to do that? Well, Paul had a vocation. Remember the last time we were together and we looked at that wonderful sermon that he preached to the elders from Ephesus there on the shores of Miletus. Remember that when he said, I haven't kept anything back. I've given you the whole counsel of God. And remember, just to remind you, here's what, what he said. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying, chains and tribulations await me. Uh, excuse me, Agabus, I know you weren't there in Miletus when I was meeting there with the Ephesian elders, but I mentioned to them that the prophecy that you've just laid on me is not new. Every city I go, the Spirit bears witness to me that what's waiting for me in Jerusalem are chains, tribulations. But his friend said, Paul, don't go. Remember what he said to the Ephesians again? None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, but that I may finish my race with joy. You remember the last words that he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy when he was awaiting his execution? He was about to be poured out, and he said, I fought the good fight of the faith. I finished the race. 
I've kept the faith. And so now when these people in Caesarea, including Luke, say, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, he gets angry. And he said, will you stop with the crying? Will you cut it out? Well, maybe he didn't say it that way. <laughs> but he said, what do you mean by weeping? You're breaking my heart. You're killing me with this stuff. I'm trying to be faithful to my vocation, and you're standing in the way. Please stop this crying and weeping. You're killing me. You're breaking my heart. And Luke said, and Paul said, for I'm ready. Luke, friends, you may not be ready for me to go to Jerusalem, but I'm ready. I've been ready since that day in the desert that Christ redeemed me and called me. And that day in the road to Damascus, I said to Jesus, where you lead me, I will follow. And everywhere He's led me, I have gone, and I'm ready to go now, not only to be bound, but I'm ready to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So Luke says, when he wouldn't be persuaded, we stopped. We, we ceased. That was the end of it. And we said, the will of the Lord be done. Boy, was that a profound theological insight. Of course the will of the Lord was going to be done. The will of the Lord is always done in the ultimate sense. And Paul understood that and said, thank you very much for saying the will of the Lord to be done. You forget you're talking to the author of Romans. I know all about the will of God, like Jesus knew about the will of God. When Jesus wrestled in the garden, saying to the Father, let the cup pass, not my will, your will be done. Because the original author of Where He Leads Me, I Will Follow was Jesus. Wherever you send me, Father, I go. Whatever cup you give me, I drink. For my meat and my drink is to do the will of the Father. And it's as if Paul said to them, do you hear it? Do you hear it? I can hear my Savior calling from Jerusalem and where He leads me, I will follow. Would that that would be the heart of every one of us in this place, to be true to our vocation, whatever it costs us, whatever it takes us, that we may be ready to run the race until it's over. What a convicting thought from Dr. R.C. Sproul today here on Renewing Your Mind. Are we really willing to go wherever He leads us? Our study in the book of Acts has revealed the Apostle Paul to be a man with one aim in life, to please Christ. That's a worthy aim for all of us as Christians, isn't it? Dr. Sproul was passionate about helping Christians know how to share the gospel with others, just like the Apostle Paul did. We heard some of that passion today, and uh, that's why he wrote the booklet, What Does It Mean to Be Born Again? This is a, a clear explanation of what it means to be saved and how you can know that you've experienced new birth. For your gift of any amount today, we'd uh, like to send you two copies of this booklet. Uh, you can make your request and give your gift when you call us at 800 435 
4343, or you can give your gift online at renewingyourmind.org. Receiving two copies of the booklet allows you to read one for yourself and give one away to a family member or friend. We hope it will start some important conversations with someone in your life. Again, for your gift of any amount, we will send you two copies of the booklet, What Does It Mean to Be Born Again? Our number again, 800-435-4343, and our web address is renewingyourmind.org. Well, next Sunday, we'll continue Dr. Sproul's series from the book of Acts. A fellow by the name of Agabus warned the Apostle Paul that if he continued on to Jerusalem, he would be bound. We'll see the results of that prophecy next week in a sermon titled, Paul's Arrest in Jerusalem. Join us next Sunday here on Renewing Your Mind.